Hello and welcome to the Food Climate Podcast. I'm Guillaume, your host, and each week, I'm fortunate to share with you stories from climate tech founders, investors, and corporations sharing their unique insights into this fast-moving industry. Eventually, like me, you will learn, discover, and get inspired by those unique men and women who are contributing to the fight against climate change, and I hope it will help you to take a step in this formidable movement. So before we start, I just want to share a few words about us as this podcast is just the tip of the iceberg of what we do at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech movement. Our mission is to accelerate capital deployment towards climate tech founders, allowing them to focus on scaling their solutions. How do we do that? Every day, we help founders access to resources and connections and gain the visibility they need to expand their growth. We do this in a number of ways with a membership platform, a Slack group, with a growing number of founders, investors, and experts from around the world. And recently, we went one step further with the matching services to connect founders with top climate tech investors. Keep in mind that we are able to do all of this thanks to the support of our listeners and our members. So please like and subscribe, share one episode with a friend, join our community, and if you haven't already done so, make a small donation to support our work. It really means the world to us. And now, enjoy the show! Hi everyone, in today's episode, we sat down with Dr. Fabian Ellman, founder and CEO at ANU, a VC impact fund focused on early stage companies, primarily located in Northern Europe and in the UK. With this evergreen fund, ANU is breaking free of the 10 years traditional VC fund model to build lasting relationships with founders they invest in by following startups through to post IPO. Fabian's background as an entrepreneur began early on when he first partnered with his brother to start a food truck business. Then he has since started five companies, including one that was sold to Google and used the proceeds to enter the investing space. But it was only later that he and his brother began to think about impact and pivot towards the climate space. And together they started ANU, which is now a 100 million evergreen fund. During this episode, we will do a deep dive to understand with Fabian how the overall climate tech sector look like and how does it differ across continents? Is it collaborative or competitive? Which sectors are most exciting or overhyped? Come along as we get a bird's eye view of the global climate tech ecosystem with an investor that has a foot on both continents. The second part of the show, Fabian gives a few super valuable tips on how to frame your pitch to be the most impactful and what he does to keep his energy up. Fabian, welcome to the show. Hi, Fabian. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super excited to have you here with us today. I'm looking forward to this great opportunity to hear your story and get up to speed on what you guys are looking at with Enu, an evergreen impact tech fund that you co-founded. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Merci, Guillaume, for having me. You're welcome. I hope uh, my French accent won't be too uh, too disturbing you. So maybe let's start uh, you know, with the, the first traditional question that we have here. Can you give us a 30-second introduction about Enu? Yes, happy to. So with Anu, um, we are focused on early stage um, climate tech investing uh, across Europe, mostly um, German speaking, Nordics and UK. We do have uh, practice groups on our team for energy transition, for carbon removal, food arc and sustainable enterprise. And recently, to give you a few examples, we have been conducting deep dives with our in-house research, for example, into energy storage, into energy in existing buildings. Uh, we've been looking into alternative construction materials, but also alternative proteins. And the value proposition of ANU is essentially centered around the ability of not only putting this two or four or six million check um, in early stages, but of being able to follow on and follow through across the lifetime 
um, of an entrepreneur and its company and be able to hold on to these companies even for 10, 12, 15 years. So technically from seed all the way to post IPO, as long as the momentum persists, because we've been breaking free from the restrictions of the 10-year fund model so, so that we are able to build true long-term relationships. So let's start uh, from the top. As you know, in this uh, in this show, we like to put uh, the speaker as a human back at the, the center of the interview. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal story and, uh, and background. I mean, what are you passionate about? What do you do besides uh, working on supporting and investing in, uh, in promising climate tech founders? I mean, what makes you feel inspired or like your best self? As I always ask, like, who is Fabian? Yeah, you know, I mean, to understand the story of uh, here, my brother and myself, we've been a team now for 20 years, started our first company in year 2000, which was actually a food truck um, back in our small hometown near Hanover, Germany. So we were born and raised really as country boys with no uh, family business or, or family wealth in the background. Um, that's how we came about. And uh, so far, you know, we started five companies ourselves. So we have a serial entrepreneurial background. One of them, which was backed by Inside Partners, uh, was a B2C marketplace called Daily Deal, which we sold to Google in 2011. And that was our first kind of landmark uh, transaction. And later um, in 2016, we founded Forco, which is now um, 600 people on the team, half a billion of equity raised, valued at 2 billion US dollars, backed by SoftBank, which is today basically the showcase for logistics technology in Europe. That's where we're coming from. And also part of the wealth that was created here is today um, put into the new fund. Yeah? So we have a very a big exposure ourselves. We've also spent 10 years, uh, mostly myself, um, on the investor side of the table. First three years from 2012 to 15, reinvesting these Google exit proceeds. Then I had the chance to become the youngest um, general partner at a firm called Early Bird which is a pan-European um, generalist um, Series A um, uh, focused VC, which I then had the uh, pleasure to scale really from a German boutique into a pan-European platform from 600 million um, capital under management all the way to 2 billion hand in hand with the founding partner generation. And um, there I launched the mobility practice, the logistics tech practice, later also the climate tech practice. And, um, and basically learned over six, seven years up until um, 2022, learned the institutional VC business from scratch, was involved with raising and deploying about half a billion of capital um, directly. And then thirdly, uh, my brother and I, you know, started looking, um, and that's where we get to the climate and impact part of our life that has become so dominating now um, um, over the past years. We started basically looking into the climate crisis, or back in the days it was still called climate change, about 2016, 2017, and felt humanity is really on a difficult trajectory. You know, the early the books and movies of Al Gore, etc. Those were the type of things that made us think about it. And the more we read, um, the more concerned we got. And and our first reaction on on that impact journey was really to change our lifestyles. We became vegetarian and put renewable electricity. And I was a passionate pilot. I later sold my plane, stopped flying, and you know we started tracking and optimizing our individual uh, kind of lifestyle footprint. Yeah? Um, then we went on to early bird to Forto and, and um, check to quantify the footprint, see where we, where we have levers, where we can manage it down, started offsetting. And then we went on and said, okay, where's the next bigger lever? Uh, let's go to the early bird portfolio and multiply, you know, the, the frameworks that we had developed for ourselves to other entrepreneurs. And this is also then how leaders for climate action emerged which we co-founded with a handful of other entrepreneurs, mostly from the Berlin tech ecosystem, to broadcast for free um, to other entrepreneurs the toolkit and frameworks for basic carbon accounting. And um, alongside with that also, they give the pledge to uh, manage down their footprint at an average. Um, the members make about 12, 15% of carbon footprint primary emissions reduction in the first year, and then it becomes more incremental Yeah, once you took the low-hanging fruits. Yeah. And they also offset VCS gold standard, their residual footprint. So there's a lot of um, 
there's been a lot of non-profit engagement for several years, um, besides, if you will, Forto and Hollywood, our profit centers. And, and ultimately, we came to the point, and this is also the story behind Anu, where we said, we don't want to live in those two different worlds in parallel, in these two different silos, but we want to merge our for-profit business activities with the point of view and with the um, contribution to funding impactful net positive, um, intentional, interlocked technologies that help solve the climate crisis and put all our weight behind it, our financial assets, our non-financial assets. And this is basically uh, the synthesis from our non-profit and for-profit background is basically a new as an Article 9 Impact Technology Fund, which we spoke about it, we launched in an evergreen structure to be a true long-term companion to the entrepreneur. That's our story, our background, and our home markets have always been the Berlin and continental European ecosystem. But today, and also at Anu, we um, have portfolio companies in the Nordics, in UK, even all the way, names like Patch or Heirloom, Running Tide and Carbon Capture, uh, Charm Industrial um, in the US. Yeah. So, uh, so that's our scope. But Fabian, you didn't tell me anything about you as a person. Personally, in terms of what do you uh, what do you like, uh, you know, besides supporting those uh, those founders, do you have any passion that you would like to to share with the audience here? Uh, that maybe other uh, you know investors or founders listening to the show could uh, reconnect with you quickly in uh, in one minute. Yeah, sure. Um, so my very first career was as a windsur windsurfer. And um, I started, so as a country boy, it wasn't so easy. I started at a small lake, then made it to the state team, later made it to the German national team in racing, uh, in surfing racing, course racing, Olympic class. Um, also competed, by the way, in, in uh, uh, Mediterranean, uh, south of France several times in world championships. Moved to Hawaii when I was 16 to a boarding school um, and uh, trained six hours every day, practice, yeah, Hukipa Beach, Maui North Shore. Um, ultimately, uh, yeah, came back, uh, continued for a while, but then had several injuries and, and had to realize it was I was not made to be a windsurfing professional. But still, water is my favorite element and the connection with the ocean still persists. I'm 40 years old now. So when I was in 20, I basically quit windsurfing and switched to traditional surfing, longboard and shortboard both. And that's also what has made me spend many, um, many summer times between Arcachon and uh, Biarritz on the French Atlantic coast, um, you know, Canary Islands, Portugal, all the way. And uh, surfing is my, is my big passion, really, um, besides, um, uh, besides um, impact investing and, and impact technology. I'm also a father of two. I live in Hamburg, um, whereas our office is, is in Berlin. It's an hour and a half train ride uh, and really enjoy spending time with my family. Well, thank you so much. So you, you mentioned your, your long uh, experience as a serial entrepreneur, as a, as a VC uh, as well. Um, would you maybe like define one piece of, uh, of experience that you had during that uh, whole uh, journey and trajectory that, uh, that you learned and uh, that in a way gave you an edge to, uh, to, to start the firm or to manage the firm differently as, uh, as you're doing today? You know, I mean, spend, or having spent um, 10 years as an investor and, and six and a half years really in institutional um, financial VC, generalist financial VC, there were a couple of realizations um, I made. Also, when we think about um, the systemic problems in the VC ecosystem per se. And one um, or the centerpiece of it is clearly around putting impact into the way we measure success. Yeah, uh, be it um, carbon safe removed, be it biodiversity gains, be it water, be, be it access to education, improved livelihoods with education technology, but generally putting impact into the equation where it also always used to be net IRR and TVPI alone. And that means for us, um, Article 9, in-house impact team, running life cycle analysis, um, uh, impact modeling, et cetera. But it also means, for example, actively sourcing for diversity in deal flow and giving those founders a chance to, to talk to us or, um, or work with us who do not come from the traditional elite universities or privileged backgrounds. Yeah. So this lack of impact thing, this realization that in the generalist VC world, it's very tight knit 
elite networks um, on the manager and on the founder side. Typically, it's not very accessible. Um, that was kind of the first defining thing for me. Um, and, uh, and and that has largely also informed our strategy uh, at Anu. And that's, for example, also why we keep our channel on the website open, where where uh, we don't um, where we don't require people to have a warm intro to our investment team if they come out from outside the, the classical networks. The second aspect, clearly, lack of liquidity in the asset class. So while there is a certain degree of secondary market in KKR and Carlyle and large, you know, buyout uh, firms, maybe at a discount here and there, but um, but th there are additional ways of of divesting also. Um, besides waiting for the fund to be fully wound down, basically, that does not really exist in VC. And I believe, or I got to the conviction that we could unlock much more capital into climate technologies if we were able to design novel ways for LPs to take back more control about their divestment timeline. And that is also um, part of the reason why we structured a new as an evergreen in Luxembourg, uh, because it enabled us to put together this gated redemption scheme. Um, it has, by the way, um, uh, Sequoia with their new evergreen fund um, have implemented um, a similar um, a, a similar methodology. Yeah. Um, so with a gated redemption scheme, but also with the secondary, with the private secondary market, which we're working on. So bringing more liquidity options to unlock more capital uh, for climate tech. And then the third big aspect um, is really all about um, alignment of interest between the key stakeholders. And that's on the one hand side, of course, the relationship between the VC or the GP and the founder. And again, also here for us, the element of forming a true long-term relationship and being able, while we invest initially in early stage, but being able to significantly follow on across stages from one balance sheet, from the same people you talk to, the same investment committee, rather than it being handed over to a growth fund, to a continuation fund, to an SPV and whatnot. Yeah. So having this consistency in the in the uh, VC to entrepreneur partnership, and then also um, when we talk about GPLP alignment, I think the old 2 and 20 uh, fee model in VC has created a lot of misalignments in terms of motivating the the GPs to gather assets, to gather assets under management and to live off of um, the management fee and, and shift risk away from the carried interest. And we saw that how VCs kept coming back to market every 12, 18 months in the um, in the past years, always increased fund size, strategy drift, etc. And um, and we believe, um, therefore, that the reduced management fees that are really closer to the actual payroll and not generating much profits on the one hand side, but also um, our the carried interest scheme that we developed that makes everyone on the team a shareholder of the fund by granting shares and not just cash, thereby aligning or putting incentive for future performance also um, is a um, uh, is, is another um, flaw of the system as it has been around for decades now. Yeah. So to summarize, impact, liquidity, and next level stakeholder alignment, um, those were the three big realizations that I made in, in all of these years in the industry and that I'm actively now addressing with a new, with structural innovation and with um, ambition also to drive systemic change and inspire other managers to follow in this direction. So, according to you, and uh, I'd like to get a little bit like you, maybe your, your overview on this uh, now since 2020, we call it climate tech, uh, you know, VC uh, ecosystem landscape. So we see uh, on a monthly basis almost like uh, new funds uh, emerging. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, not all of them are like uh, driven by uh, by impact. Maybe the, the the structure of the of the fees in the traditional um, model uh, of VC might not be the, the most uh, applicable, and and definitely this uh, uh, length in terms of like. Uh, uh, ambition to support the founders if momentum is still there, as you mentioned prior to that, is something very important. And often, you know, uh, when you uh, give, especially on the early stage, uh, I would say the flag to the next uh, next round, uh, your your job is done, uh, your valuation goes up on paper, and uh, you focus on other uh, founders. So 
Can you maybe give us like your overview on the European uh, climatic ecosystem today? Are we in this uh, bubble uh, type uh, of market right now? And if you can maybe compare that a little bit to the uh, US market, uh, just a general view, and then maybe we can uh, dive into it uh, together to understand a little bit more like the complexity, what are the, the challenge, uh, and I would say the, the weakness on the European side versus the US side. Uh, as I saw that uh, you guys also invested in the in, in California in uh, at least two of the the company that we had on the show uh, recently as well. Uh, so very excited to to hear your opinion on there. Yeah, no. Um, so generally, you know, when you look at the current market environment and also in the context of the last 18, 24 months, uh, we all know um, how hard the technology sector, um, both private but also NASDAQ and public equity uh, valuations in, in tech have been hit by um, the rise by the end of the um, of the um, uh, of the cheap money, if you will, or by the tapering of both uh, Federal Reserve and European Central Bank rising interest rate uh, that led to decline in, in public equity valuations and then trickled down from there into growth stage, late stage, now all the way to Series A. Seed is still the sector that is least impacted in terms of deal count and also round size valuations. But already in um, 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 Series A, now in the past three to four, five months, has um, has been, has been taking a hit and, and and it went all the way down. And so on a macro level, you know, also when you look at past crises like two thousand eight, two thousand one, etc., um, you could always observe that uh, private um, equity and also VC valuations and deal activity has been trailing about three to four quarters behind public. So if we assume it may be the case that we saw the, the bottom in, in public in November, uh, 2023, still a very difficult um, year in private. If we see a third um, Elliott wave, we uh, see a third hit for whatever reason, nuclear in, in Ukraine whatsoever, yeah, we don't know, maybe Black Swan, another one, um, then um, we can expect um, the, the bad sentiment to to go all the way well into 2024, high level. Now, on the contrary, we have seen um, uh, tailwinds and, and, and a lot of political support and generally um, broad stakeholder support for climate technology as, say, as a, as a sub-segment or sibling segment of the, say, commerce, fintech, consumer health, um, et cetera, enterprise SaaS, um, the generalist segments. And and that means, as you said, a lot of new emerging managers, most of them in Europe looking at the early stage, most of them with smaller fund sizes, say 20 to 100 million. Um, quite crowded segment now, absolutely, yeah. But it's also good, yeah, uh, because when you look at the general on an SG, SDG level or also an energy transition on the funding gaps, we are still not there, yeah. So it could, it 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 needs a much more, much bigger effort generally on on allocating more capital uh, to the sector. Um, we have less uh, so um, populated the growth in late stage segment. There is the light rock. There is the generation I am. But they, for example, in fifteen years, I've never done a deal, of, maybe on the continent at least not in Germany. Yeah. So there's very few players. TPG Rise, maybe looking a little bit into Europe, sometimes Brookfield, but there's very few um, European players really in the growth and late stage. So there's again um, this necessity for companies to then go to the US or go to Singapore, uh, to Asia to look for capital, and um, and generally um, the climate tech um, investment volume and deal volume has shown a strong resilience. So. It has been when you look at the um, Q2, Q3, Q4 data um, of 2022, it has been basically flat um, and in, in some quarters even up um, on a year over year uh, comparison. Whereas the general market has been down 30, 50, 60% or whatever segment you are picking. Yeah. So I think this is this is giving good evidence for the general you know mindset shift in terms of professional investors, institutional investors allocating more towards climate, um, but the ecosystem is still young. And I think a big risk that we are facing now in the climate tech ecosystem is basically another bubble or another um, uh, inflated um, inflated valuations fueled on the one hand side by a lot of emerging managers 
um, when you look at the relation also of emerging companies, yeah, uh, how many targets, uh, demand, supply, but also by IRA, yeah, uh, the emissions, um, the the Inflation Reduction Act of the Biden administration, which by of of, of course is a historically important and relevant act, and is generally, um, um, I think we should all appreciate the commitment. Um, um, of um, of the Biden administration to faster develop and also faster scale and roll out um, certain um, technologies that help us mitigate the climate crisis. But the risk is again here, like in the clean tech bubble in Europe, two thousand five to two thousand eight nine. The risk is again that business models and technologies get funded, which cannot in um, in market environment in a non subsidized way which cannot achieve price parity feature parity etc in the long run that's a risk that we need to um, that we need to be mindful of and especially even more so as we anticipate um, the european union or the the brussels administration to react to the ira which has also some protectionist and industrial policy elements to it yeah? so it is, in generally, um, I think a good a, a good evolution that we're seeing. But we must look we must look through to the to the foundation of the companies, to the foundation foundational um, DNA also of the technologies when we make investment decisions, and must make sure we do not get carried away by political tailwinds, which are always temporary in nature, um, because otherwise um, we are risking to have another um, uh, implosion, so to say, like 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 we had it in the late um, 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 2000 years. I'd like to double click a little bit on, um, you know, the, the ecosystem per se, and at first on the um, uh, on, on the investor side and do, those different funds and those different like uh, GP and, uh, in, you know, all the, the investors uh, and VCs touring around all of that. So when you look at like the ecosystem per se, do you feel that, uh, there is a lot of competition between those different actors uh, or there is a sense of collaboration because of this uh, greater purpose and cause that, you know, supporting climate and climate tech companies uh, can offer uh, to this uh, investment uh, type compared to the traditional VC ecosystem, uh, I would say, where competition sometimes is, uh, is really there. Uh, let's be honest, people are competing for the, the best deal. Um, do you see that uh, at the European level there is collaboration? Do you see at the uh, you know European versus uh, the US? Uh, do you see collaboration in between uh, the, the two ecosystem or uh, a lot of uh, uh, competition? And would you define like sometimes the the US uh, you know funds more ambitious uh, in terms of like type of uh, of fundings than uh, the European one? Um, what's, your, uh, what's your take there? It sounds that you have a, a good view on both sides of the Atlantic. So love to hear your uh, opinion there. Yeah, no, so so first of all, um, having been on both sides, I, I think um, I observe a higher degree of, of collaboration within Climate Tech and Article 9 players than in traditional generalist VC. Um, this does not necessarily always extend to the deal level. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, only one or two funds can lead or co-lead a deal, not five. Yeah, um, uh, that is the nature of the game. So on deal level, there is sometimes competition. Yes, um, but um, but that's also, if you will, a natural part of evolution and 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 of players making it or not making it in the market and proving their value add and their raison d'être or their right uh, uh, to a seat at the table. Yeah, and um, but it, it extends much more so to general sharing of knowledge, um, often also of deals, of research, and and I can say, for example, on with regards to a new. On our website, we have a resource section uh, where there's 10 or 12 resources, including, for example, our 20 pages core impact framework detailing our methodology, our theory of change, our thresholds, et cetera, et cetera. So um, um, we take a very collaborative approach and actually share our proprietary DNA and secret source even with the whole market, because we um, do not um, uh, we do not think about it in terms of something to protect, but we think about it in a way of something to hopefully also inspire others and jointly you know up our game and as an ecosystem evolve towards more standardization on impact measurement, like for like comparison, getting to the point where we can compare impact performance. 
um, just as we can compare financial performance where we have US GAAP and IFRS and whatnot. Yeah, we need to get to that same level, if you will, of, of, of benchmarking on impact. And that's one of the big challenges here with still a lot of greenwashing and any players out there who do not really go all the way for LCAs, for modeling, for safe and sound, I mean, um, um, scientifically safe methodology, but invest more like this is directionally right. So I'm doing it, but you, I mean, you can't optimize what you can't measure, right? And also whether it's really net positive and how much it is net positive, you need to measure, you need to put the effort. Um, some Also some entrepreneurs are, annoyed at times by the reporting or data requests we put, but otherwise it's not real impact investing. Then it's just good intentions and directionally right investing. And then, um, you know, that's just not what we are here for. We want to make sure that um, we actually meet the impact thresholds that we, that we invest and we need the data. So, but going back, um, so yeah, more collaboration generally on, on, on the impact um, investor landscape. Looking at US, so we co-invest um, quite um, frequently with uh, Breakthrough Energy, a couple of deals, lower carbon capital, a couple of deals, um, Union Square um, uh, uh, and Union uh, USV, especially USV Climate. We've also uh, syndicated recently, for example, at Alsemi, low carbon concrete and cement in Berlin. We uh, um, syndicated with Galvanize. From the west coast um uh, we also um uh, now have energize um, in monta denmark um, e-charging infrastructure maintenance software so we have quite um uh, we have quite a good handful of uh, relationships in the us generally again and this is uh, similar to to what we've seen in the in the um, in the in the mainstream vc ecosystem there are larger funds that write larger checks because the LP market is larger and the ecosystem is more developed and that almost kind of transferred from generalist VC also to, to climate tech VC. Um, when, when you compare it again to these more like micro or, or small size-ish funds that we see um, popping up um, across Europe. Um, our, you know, our edge, how, how do we get into deals like Patch or Heirloom, um, et cetera? Um, or Zero Avia, our edge is oftentimes connected to helping these U.S. companies setting foot on the ground um, in Europe, especially in continental Europe and the German-speaking countries where we have a very strong sales and best dev network, but also talent network. Um, and there we often um, invest in follow-up positions. In Europe, we increasingly co-lead Seed Series A, the classical playbook, board seat involvement, target ownerships between Five and 12 to 14 percent active involvement, always two people on each company. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, th that's my answer to the to the question. Thank you. I, on the on the founder side, I would say like on the on the deal side, I think we, we covered quite well the, the the funding and the the investor side. So. What is um? I mean, how would you qualify like the the, the type of deals and and companies and, and and founders on the European side versus the 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 US side in itself? I mean, do you see like major difference? Uh, things that uh, in terms of maybe talent, resource, experience, uh, quality of the deal uh, in uh, in general, and maybe what is missing. Uh, to those uh, to those founders today. I mean, you mentioned in your um, at, at the beginning of this interview that uh, we can uh, basically post our uh, pitch deck uh, on your website directly, and we don't need a a warm intro uh, or being uh, screened by someone. Um, so, what would be missing on the founder side as well to accelerate this, uh, you know, visibility and and and, and, and I would say uh, attractiveness that uh, to to have a be seen by a comp by a funds like yours. Long question. Yeah, long question. So generally, we are quite excited um, and then in a positive way, also surprised about the number of founders that are flocking towards general any type of impact and specifically climate impact um, uh, technologies and 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 really putting their weight behind it and also serial entrepreneurs. I mean, like Ferry and I, my brother. We also grew up as generalist or, if you will, financially driven serial entrepreneurs. So then at some point realized 
what we do doesn't really, you know, contribute um, in a meaningful way in the greater scheme of things. And what's ultimately, you know, what's the contribution you want to make? What's the positive legacy you want to build? And I think more and more entrepreneurs are waking up to this um, to this question, and um, and that's great. And and that means that many also serial entrepreneurs, experienced entrepreneurs, um, with their next companies flock flock into um, in, into the area, such as our friend Christian Vollmann, for example, who has been big in in, in um, online dating, etc. And now does Carbon One, the um, the alternative fuels company for shipping, yeah? um, which is um, by the way competing with X Fuel from our portfolio also bio drop in fuels company where we call it with USV, which is based in Spain. Yeah. So um, no, I think on the founder side, we have a good momentum in Europe. What's missing. Um, so we do observe a, um, a lesser degree of, um, um, of risk appetite on hardware and deep tech in Europe versus US. Yeah. Um, that may also uh, have to do with the generally uh, lesser maturity of the European ecosystem. Yeah? Um, and, um, and also in Europe, you see, if you see some of the tourist uh, investors, generalists that do a couple of, you know, climate related deals, some of them maybe because they really mean it. Some of them maybe also because their LPs are pressuring them, you know, case by case. Yeah. Uh, but, but that those tourist investors who also typically do not, um, uh, do not have the capacity or the motivation to truly analyze um, and, and uh, truly bring impact methodology to the table, but who more go for like directionally right investments. Uh, those you typically see happening in pure software plays. They just no, yeah, are just afraid of taking the hardware and, and deep tech development risk mostly. And um, and in that context, and, and for, in, for, for ourselves, by the way, we do about 30, 35% hardware deep tech and 60% easier to scale IoT platforms, software related plays. Yeah? And I think every investor needs to decide also for uh, for themselves, what's the right profile given also your competence profile? Yeah, um, deep tech hardware investing requires different, also more um, engineering, more deep tech know how in the team and in in the network of the um, of the VC than it does if you um, if you are specialized in enterprise, for for example. So everyone needs to decide uh, by himself. But generally, we observe a lack of of funding availability for such type of businesses, and clearly many areas across the t climate tech stack, so to say, uh, cannot be addressed purely on a software basis. And, and that goes hand in hand also with mezzanine capital, project finance availability. So other non-dilutive um, grant subsidy, revolving credit lines, working capital, et cetera, other, um, a, hand, a handful of other financing instruments um, that we now urgently need to build in the European ecosystem and make more in a more structural way accessible to the hardware and deep tech companies so that they can scale because not everything, not all of their financing needs um, um, can be covered with dilutive equity yeah, from the nature of the game. So, so this is something we are concerned about and we were also trying to contribute towards by building partnerships um, that that ease the process and accelerate the process for these companies um, with certain banks and certain specialist um, funds and platforms to get access to such type of um, funding. So I think it's a good time to uh, move on a little bit more on the uh, ANU and uh, what you guys are uh, doing for the for the funders and the, the funders ecosystem in itself. So. Um, I like to understand that you, you you mentioned that uh, you have definitely and through the different example that you uh, just mentioned as well, have this like uh, founders DNA uh, and founders like really willingness to support your uh, companies that you invested in. So can you like just maybe uh, share with uh, with the audience like what do you offer and 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 that do solutions uh, that you are uh, or support that you offer to them. Maybe are they related to uh, typical, I would say, uh, challenges that uh, early stage companies um, can face and that you identified? So maybe this uh, this parallel in between both would be uh, interesting to share. Yeah, no. Yeah. So generally, we are um, active investors um, when it comes to a hands-on value add. And essentially, there are four major reasons 
that typically make us win deals. Yeah. And those four um, aspects are the first one is the operational experience that we have on the team. So we have unicorn founders and serial entrepreneurs on the team that are available for the strategic, but also operational sparring and coaching with the founders. And that is quite rare. Yeah? Uh, we're not the only ones, but it's quite rare. Second um, is the in-house impact competence. So we have two people currently out of 11 um, on the impact team. There's Harvard and Yale graduates. Um, we have the capability to do full-blown impact modeling in-house, life cycle assessments. We help them with impact measurement, reporting, governance. We run after investing, we run impact workshops with the companies. So impact competence, second point. Third point is the market access, especially on the continent and even more so in the German speaking countries when it comes to enterprise sales and biz dev. Yeah. So 90% of our companies or 80% of our companies are B2B companies. Yeah. And, um, and, and opening doors to potential clients, collaboration on kind of S&P 500, Euro stocks type of level, yeah, but also large family owned businesses from our network and also then talent helping them recruit um, all the way to media, speaker opportunities, et cetera. So market access is the third one, yeah. especially for UK and US companies. It comes a lot into play, not so much for those who are based um, in, um, in Berlin or in Munich or in Zurich. And then the fourth one is really this aspect around the long-term partnership that we are able to form from our ever evergreen structure, really from seed series A with an infinite holding period with the ability to significantly increase investment over time, not just a small follow-on check, but really go from 2 million to 5 to 7 to 10 and beyond from one balance sheet with the same people um, and, uh, and be a true long-term partner really across the full maturity cycle, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, you name it, as long as the company you know, maintains its momentum. So these four aspects, operational experience, impact competence, market access and long-term partnership with follow-on capital. Um, uh, these are typically um, the edges um, that make entrepreneurs want to partner with our team at Anu. So you, you guys mentioned uh, you are doing some uh, some sort of like at least different uh, deep dive uh, in different uh, subcategories of the uh, climate tech uh, ecosystem or industry, uh, if we can call it like that. Uh, which sector are the most uh, promising for you today in terms of what I call the ICR or impact cash uh, return, uh, meaning building impactful companies while creating highly profitable business? Any underdogs or subsectors, uh, areas that you're especially excited about and that uh, you would like to share? Yeah, so we run about um, eight deep dives per year. Um, each of them takes us uh, with two people and um, three people, sometimes including an analyst intern, um, takes about two to three months um, and, and then releases a 20, 20 to 30 page document that a chart that goes top down, mapping a certain segment, subsegment, identifying the relevant impact opportunities and impact problems, identifying the relevant technologies, and then drilling further and further into the competitive landscape and sharpening our thesis and what exactly um, uh, do we want to invest in this space, and then all the way to identifying specific target companies where we then also um, go outbound. Yeah? And, um, and some of our recent investments have been um, resulting from the deep dives. Um, the others mostly result from our network with impact angels, accelerators, pre-seed funds, et cetera, um, um, sharing deals with us or bringing deals to our attention. Yeah. And, um, and recently we've been, for example, looking into energy in existing buildings around energy management systems, IoT, et cetera, where we still think, and this is kind of complementary to then novel construction materials um, uh, or things like Alsami, we spoke about it, uh, low carbon concrete and cement for new buildings. Yeah. Uh, we believe um, not neglecting um, existing buildings and their decades of remaining lifespan is important. Um, and, um, and and this is, for example, an area we're excited about and where we also with Zolar in Germany, with Home Tree, slightly different model in the UK, 
home home decarbonization for 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 homeowners. Yeah, you can also extend that then into the commercial space, etc. Um, where we already have ex um, existing uh, investments. We are also excited about virtual power plants and demand response. This is uh, this is a current deep dive uh, in in Q1. 2023, uh, we've recently started, or in H2 last year, started to look deeper into biodiversity and different plays, um, all the way from you know project financing to measurement, reporting, verification, all the way to then um, you know bio uh, biodiversity credit, marketplaces, uh, etc., land banking. We have recently made a first investment in a biodiversity MRV company based in UK not yet disclosed. It also resulted from such deep dive. Yeah. Uh, we've been looking into precision agriculture to give you a few, um, to give you a few um, uh, ideas. So if I take the opposite side, uh, what are you not excited about? I mean, um, in a way, I would say like, I mean, out of all of those uh, you know, pitch that, that you hear, uh, which are the solution that you believe makes no sense whatsoever and sounds like you know, maybe more like a waste of time and, and resource or even greenwashing. Do you have a couple of examples without naming uh, anyone there that you uh, think that, you know, people are putting this label of like climate and climate tech or uh, green and impact, in fact, uh, is uh, maybe not uh, the way to go? Yeah, um, good question. So I think in mobility, there are several solutions out there which are, um overrated when it comes to the climate impact and and that you can only see when you really run life cycle assessments and not just by saying ah well electrified is always better than combustion engine and so on yeah directionally right yeah um the question is also what do you substitute do you substitute a, a person in a combustion engine car do you substitute public transport do you substitute bike ride pedestrian yeah, it's the devil is in the details so i think in mobility you know um you have to look close to really get down to the to the um uh, net positive impact potential also in some logistics tech models that are labeled as kind of climate tech or green it's not always uh, so much the case um we've run a deep dive on food waste reduction um, that came where we came out a bit, um, yeah, this, this discouraged, I would say, yeah, where the problem per se is big, but so far, and there have been many attempts to tackle it across several parts upstream, downstream, the value chain, yeah, but, um, we realized that basically no company really so far, be it US, be it Europe, elsewhere really got to a meaningful commercial scale and, and, and commercial sustainability as well, yeah? beyond good intentions and pilots and whatnot. The food waste we felt for ourselves is hard to address with our ambition of really funding companies that can get to a um, billion dollar standalone um, um, market defining companies that are at some point IPO ready and not just that 100 million trade sale to a strategic acquirer. That's not what we're in for. Yeah? We are truly looking for the game-changing, industry-defining companies that can remain standalone and also define their own destiny thereby. Yeah? We've been in the uh, shoes of the acquired company with Google before. Smart people at Google, yeah, great company, but it was very painful for us. Um, so yeah, <laughs> food waste, to mention another one. And then I think, you know, tactically, when you look at the market, I think um, we saw um, in the last 18 months quite a bit of um, valuation inflation in alternative proteins or in, in several, uh, um, I'd say, novel food sectors. Yeah? And I think these will be coming down um, in the next 12, 18 months. The sector is maturing. Yeah, We see retail launches and very tasty great, uh, also nearing price parity products, but it's just about right sizing, so to say, the pricing for these companies um, um, in, in, in the near future. So I think um, uh, th that was definitely a, um, a hyped uh, sector yeah, in 2021, especially partially also into 2022. Yeah. But we remain excited fundamentally because the food um, food problem, so to say, from, from a carbon um, um, emissions perspective is a giant. Yeah. So 
Personal question uh, on my side. I mean, uh, what's your personal view on the on the climate crisis? Uh, I mean, what would you say to to the people who are like feel demoralized by all the already visible consequences uh, of of climate change, uh, all those terrible news? I mean, are we doomed? Well, I mean, the current trajectory is uh, is not very promising, as we know not only since COP27 and, you know, having basically the certainty that we missed the 1.5 degree scenario and are now more geared towards a 2% uh, also a 2 degree scenario. And also in terms of tipping points, et cetera, the increasing uncertainty, uh, have we reached some, et cetera, what is, uh, what is going to be the reinforcing um, effect? Um, in, 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 so, so generally, yes, the the bad news um, have been um, have been dominating in the past quarters because because they are reality, and uh, and, and, and 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 proven in a scientific way. I mean, this is not a political debate; it's just facts, right? And um, and nevertheless, you know, being an entrepreneur at heart, I think there's no. Um, there's no um, sense in giving up or in resignating because we know every uh, decimal degree, every point one degree makes a difference for tens of millions uh, of people in the world. And um, and therefore fighting, continue to fight with, with our um, energy, with our um, financial assets, with advocating our voice in public, influencing uh, circle of control, circle of influence, influencing stakeholders, is uh, the only um, right way forward. Um, um, also, because this is a multi-decade challenge, and we cannot just stop and say, oh, we've lost. Yeah, um, uh, Because really what's at stake still is whether it will be 1.8 or 2.2 or 2.6 degrees. It makes such a big difference that every increment is helpful. And um, from my point of view, you often have this kind of left-wing, right-wing discussion politically. The left wing says uh, we we have to um, we have to limit our consumption. We have to give up some of our habits. The right wing says, or the, the alt right and, and, and libertarians say, oh no problem, just keep carry on, and we'll develop the technologies. This is going to save us. Yeah, I think it's exactly the combination. So we do, of course, our business is to develop these technologies that that help us render services and and, and products in a more um, sustainable and eco-friendly way that uh, that 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 secure a well-being and 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 a pleasant life for generations to come and 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 for billions of people out there. But at the same time, while uh, you know these technologies are are partially not there yet or in pilot stage and not ready for scaling and mass adoption, of course we need to take immediate action and also think about our individual footprints, our company footprints. Um, uh, and, and and need to combine these two levers. That's basically also our day-to-day life um, um, across all of these levels from personal lifestyle to, you know, how do you invest? Uh, how do you run your company? How do you influence? Uh, and, and, and that's what uh, what drives us making, you know, optimizing for, for the best, for the biggest possible impact that we can have across the levers that, that we have in our uh, life. Yeah. So what's next for ENU and uh, how the community of uh, investors, founders, experts uh, around the world listening to the show can uh, can help you? So first of all, um, always reach out if you are um, climate tech founders via our website, LinkedIn, get an intro. Uh, we, we are open to new business. We are um, we are working to do eight to 10 new investments this year, mostly seed and series A in Europe. Um, and um, and always happy uh, to get in touch. Uh, first of all, um, second of all, we will um, continue um, in this collaborative approach of publishing a lot of our research and also impact methodology. We are releasing our first full impact report across the portfolio on March second this year. We'll also make it largely available um, uh, to, to the public. Um, we are actually adding a senior investor. We're adding another partner, a, f- a fifth senior investor to our team uh, this year, um, uh, which will be based in Europe, um, maybe um, on the continent, maybe also in the Nordics or UK region. So if you feel um, like you have these five to seven years of institutional investment experience are truly impact driven uh, and want to take a walk on the wild side uh, away from the generalist VC landscape, 
um, then please reach out. Yeah. Uh, also, again, via LinkedIn uh, or via our website. Um, and you know, generally, we are on a we are on a so we are executing with a new against a thirty year roadmap. Yeah. And and really with this um, with this ambition to build something like the Berkshire Hathaway of impact technology in Europe and truly driving systemic change towards impact, towards novel liquidity options, towards this next level stakeholder alignment. And this is for me personally, I must say, the most rewarding and uh, and most uh, exciting mission uh, I could be on after, you know, having spent so many years really in, in generalist uh, VC and also in, in, if you will, in generalist uh, uh, tech companies. Um, and uh, I'm just grateful for, for being around the, the people that I can work with, be it our founders on the portfolio, be it the new team, also be it many of our LPs at the fund also do direct investing. And there's so many, you know, connections, such an ecosystem we're building that it's, it's great fun. And, um, and on March 2nd, actually, we're also hosting our first a new summit in Berlin, bringing the whole ecosystem together, including academia, NGOs, founders, other um, climate tech GPs as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, continue on that path. Any question I should have uh, asked you and I did not for this uh, first part of the interview? Um, no, let's go on. Let's go on to the okay. second part. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Fabian, for your time, your incredible insights, uh, your motivation, uh, so much uh, hard work that you put into the, this fight against uh, climate change and supporting founders who are like, uh, uh, doing that as well, so really enabling them. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you uh, on the show with us. Merci, Guillaume. Pleasure was mine. And look forward to staying in touch. All the best. Thanks again for joining us on the Tech Footnote podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Stay tuned next week for more Climate Tech Insights. In the meantime, head on over to our webpage at startupbasecamp.org where we have lots more insights and resources for anyone wanting to get involved in climate tech. If you find our resources useful, please consider donating to support our small self-funded team. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends and see you next time.